So as I was saying, and as a matter of fact, I think I should show you guys. This is our society website. It's called the Society for Community Research and Action, right? It's, um, it's a division of the American Psychological Association. Um, so it's a typical, we're academic, but we also do a lot of practice. So we infuse it with what we are trying to do here today to show that um, many of what we do, where we come from, especially on the continent of Africa is, uh, is embedded in a lot of practice. So my role is this, is the regional network coordinator. So meaning I've been traveling across the world, holding different seminars and conferences uh, all over the world. These are the regions that I, that I kind of um, oversee for the, um, for the organization, uh, for the society. Uh, fortunately for us, we are here talking about the African continent. Um, so I have both the coordinator from the East Africa and West Africa coordinating this uh, particular uh, event today. Um, Loretta, by way of um, transition, do you want to uh, uh, take over from me or do you still need me to put more context into what we are doing? Or is that okay? Um, <laughs> you've done awesome, but um, if you could just um, shed more light across um, the speakers we're bringing on board and mm -hmm. why in particular we um having them speak today or um, the lecture they will be um, sharing with us, why in particular we'll be working with them this morning because um, Dr. Adeliki and um, Dr. Pascalia is also on. So if we could just shed a bit of light in that regard, that would be good. And also um, the Olu, Olu that will be joining us as well. Mm -hmm. And the whole idea about the healing session, we could just talk about briefly the three um, sessions we'll be having. That would be good. Then myself and Dr. Sarah Bon can take it up from there. Okay. And thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um. So I have a feeling like um, all the participants are here and they will do justice to what they are what they what they will be speaking about uh we've invited them because they practice on the continent and they are coming to tell us how they use these tools to practice on the continent and uh, what they do and how they do it uh, i believe uh, uh, pascalia is a um she's a doctoral candidate and she, she's bringing in a couple of africans um uh systems that she's been using in a in a training as a doctoral candidate i believe um um Dr. Tosin is already a doctor from the University of, um, I believe the first one I got was University of Ibadan, but I see it was changed later. So I'm sure they'll give a better uh, context to their, uh, uh, their profession. But what we were trying to do was to marry what they are doing with the practice here in the sort of in the West and see how we can link this academic space where we, where we exist to how they practice on the continent. That's, I th that's what I thought we were trying to uh, bring in, but I'm sure they will do more justice to, um, uh, to what they're bringing for us. And I'm sure you all will enjoy it. Uh, uh, Ulu Okao is also here. Uh, he's probably gonna um, do a little bit of meditation, a little bit of talking and coaching uh, to all of us this morning after the two lectures are done. I think we want to stick around for that one in particular. So thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Moshud. Uh, good morning, everybody. And um, you're welcome to the first um, Scra African Lecture Series. My name is Loretta Ikane Momale. I am first um, a doctoral student at the National Lewis University on the Community Psychology um, 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 Program. And um, secondly, the West African Regional Coordinator for Scra, and I do other things. Um, my interest and why I took on the role to work with Dr. Moshud in the West African region is because over a decade, say precisely about 13, 14 years of my life, I have done a lot of community work um, as regards public health community work a lot in the nukes and crannies of Nigeria and some other parts of West Africa and a bit of East Africa as well. And I see that there are a lot of in, in, in innovations, a lot of approaches, a lot of strategies that are, I mean, are, I mean, introduced from the Western culture into the African culture. And we see that some of our programs or projects fail because we do not integrate 
the African concepts, we don't integrate the African culture and values into those programs that have been introduced from the West. And so what we try to do when we identify these gaps was to work more with the traditional, the custodians of our tradition, the custodians of our values back in Africa. And we try to marry them together. We try to partner with them and see how we can have this, um, how we can make um, some of this work, some of the um, projects, some of the program uh, around public health, how we can make it more effective and how we can um, how we can have an impactful um, 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 program, which we piloted severally and it was a success. And what that's the eye opener for us was whatever program will be introduced or whatever program is being introduced to Africa, there must be a core interest, a core partnership and collaboration with the custodians, custodian of the African culture. And that is why I am going to be kind of bridging that gap in my role to say, as long as we're introducing some of these programs from the West and taking them to Africa, let's ensure that we continue to identify custodians of the culture, custodians of our, I mean, our values back at home and ensure that they are part of the programming that from the design stage to the, to, through all the processes of programming or projects or interventions in Africa. And that's the role I will be playing to also um, collaborate and partner with people, um, with organizations, <clears throat> institutions, academic um, bodies that will be interested in doing all of that back in, Af in West Africa. It was starting, of course, from Nigeria, which is my home country. And Dr. Tosin is here and he'll be helping talk about a lot around substance use, this order and how they've been able to use the help or support or partnership of traditional um, traditional practice and um, collaboration with traditional um, custodians of our tradition back in Nigeria and how that has been very effective in their work with people with substance use disorder. And um, so that's a, a bit of what <clears throat> I will, my role is. That's just a, a bit of it. I would ask um, Dr. Sarah Gon to, um, Sister Sarah Gon to talk a bit about her role as the East African coordinator, after which <clears throat> we'll want a couple of people, maybe two, three or four people to just share what their expectations will be or what their expectations are even for this meeting. Sister Sarah Gon, over to you. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. I'm very excited to see all of you. It's an honor that you are all here. I am the new coordinator for East Africa, and I'm very excited to be part of this. And part of the reason is as follows. So um, I, I'm, I've been a student here at NLU. I got my master's and my PhD degree from NLU. And for my dissertation, I looked at what I call Afro-pessimism, which is this negative view that the West has about Africa. And I wanted to see how that impacts international students as they come to the US. And so being in Scra, I think it's an opportunity for me to showcase that there is a lot of good in Africa that often is not, does not come across in the media. And, and it's, it's an exciting time for me to be able to do that. And I think what I'll be doing is um, work with communities and help them showcase what we do. Personally, it, it seems like what we do at home is a lot of practice even though it's not researched or it's not written on academic journals, but we do a lot of research. I mean, we do a lot of community practice. And I think with the challenges we have, I think what keeps us going back at home is the fact that there is community and most of what we do is we are there for each other. And when there are challenges, the community is there to support each other. And I think that's how we survive. And that's what I hope um, we can showcase being the, the coordinator from East Africa. I'll stop there and- Yeah, um, mm -hmm. thank, thank you, sister. Before we introduce our first speaker, 
um, anyone could just go and anyone could volunteer to just um, take the first step. You want to just share with us your name, um, where you're joining us from, any affiliation, um, academic institution, um, the IFA Foundation, and just tell us a bit of what your expectations are today. And so um, by the end of the meeting, we want to find out, we want to um, identify you, you, we've been able to help you achieve one or two of your expectations. Um, anyone could volunteer to take the first step. Yes, please, Yalinda, go ahead. Hi, I'm Yalinda. I uh, live in Las Vegas, Nevada. I'm currently a, uh, I have a little private practice and I'm a marriage and family therapist. And I've been working with the IFA Foundation with uh, Iavasa. And so I was invited to come. I don't know uh, any expectations I have. I'm just here to absorb information and see what this is about. I'm just very excited to be here and be invited. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, I'm, uh, uh, my name, my, my real name is Merle Wolf. Um, I'm uh, uh, a Babalao uh, Ipatunde, um, Ogoiburu, uh, Urbane. Um, I'm just uh, recently initiated with by the Ifa Foundation. Um, I'm just here to learn, kind of absorb new information um, and, and just kind of learn. Uh, I'm also from Las Vegas, um, Yolinda uh is my wife so um but we're on, so <laughs> it's good thank to you. have but it's good to have both of you here thank you for joining us thank yes you. yeah postima did i pronounce that correctly you did that was very close yes uh von postima thank you. <laughs> um i'm von postima i'm here in charleston south carolina i've been um just joining uh, the EFA Foundation and some weekly um, chats. And so my only expectation is to know more than I knew coming into this. So just here to learn. All right, thank you. Okay, I think that's the whole of the, is there someone else I'm missing? Okay, I think that's about it. All right, um, Sister Sergon, could you go ahead? Okay, then introduce our first speaker. Thank you. Okay. Our first speaker is born and raised among the Tugen community of Kenya. Her perspective and outlook on life is shaped by the traditions and values of this community. As a child, she was socialized into the indigenous ways of living community as well as in skills for relating intimately with nature. Career-wise, she works with the Jesuit African AIDS Network as the program's officer and capacity builder, responsible for coordinating projects and conducting trainings on integral youth development in 17 African countries. She has a bachelor's and master's degrees and is a current PhD candidate in social transformation with specialization in sustainable development. She is passionate about indigenous knowledge systems and practices. Her motivation is the conviction that authentic sustainable development ought to be premised on an economic model that borrows heavily from the values of indigenous knowledge systems. Joining us now from Kinshasa, Congo, is Pascalia Chelagat Sergon. Thank you very much, Sister Margaret, for that introduction. So I really don't need to add more. I think um, I will go straight to the presentations that I'm going to give. And um, I suppose I have um, the right to share. OK. Thank you, everyone. And I'm glad to be here with you 
and thank you for the opportunity. Already Margaret has introduced me. And as she said, I really think that we need to appreciate more uh, indigenous systems. And for this reason, I love to bring that out so that the more we know, the more we appreciate. This presentation was part of my master's um, work, and it is on the role of indigenous knowledge, practices, values, and promoting social economic well being and equity among the Indoroi's community of Kenya. Please, Margaret, confirm that I'm clear. Audible enough? Yes. Good. So uh, let me start by positioning myself in relation to this study. So um, I'm both Endoroys and Tugen. Therefore, I'm not new to the community, to the indigenous community that I worked in this study. However, um, according to the community, I am a Tugen because clan system clan follows the patriarchal lines. So actually, when you come to the Tugen community, I am Kobilo, and which means the, the daughter of the clan of Kobilo. When, when I go to the Endorois community, who are now Kamama to me, I am the child of their daughter. And they treat me with that respect. So Tugen, and Endorois are both indigenous communities, linguistically and culturally related. And they all belong to the larger Kalenjin nation. So, but who are the Endorois? I'm, I'm giving you this background so that you have an idea of the people we are talking about. So they are semi-pastoralists from Baringo and they practice indigenous religion spirituality. Lake Bogoria is a sacred site for them, for their spiritual and cultural practices, and their own understanding of this heritage. There is a legend uh, among the, the Endorois and the Tugan community about the, um, the, the, the origin of Lake Bogoria. And I'll, maybe I'll tell you that uh, uh, later. Um, and it also the, the Endorise community compared to the members of the Kalenjin groups live in an area with very limited resources. However, their intimate understanding of environment, indigenous systems that thrive in the environment has given them uh, enabled them to create an egalitarian society, an environmental care based on the concepts of math and Kigre. You will get to know more about math and Kigre in this, in, in, in this presentation. But to just say that math is the, the, it is the social code of conduct of the Kalenji nation. Its object is harmony. And therefore, our way of life must always lead to harmonious living so that poverty is seen as much gone wrong, for example. Environmental destruction is much gone wrong. Okay. Uh, among the Endorese, uh, again, they have a blended model of, of leadership. They have the politically uh, elected lead leaders, but then for their day-to-day -day, uh, um, organization, they use the indigenous system of governance, which is the elders. And their top leadership is known as the Endorois Council of Elders. Endorois came to the limelight sometimes in 1990s, uh, beginning actually from around 1973, uh, way up to 1990s, when they took the government of Kenya to international court to claim their historical land, which was along around Lake Bogoria. 
because the government decided to gazette it as a national reserve and they won the case. So the African Commission for Human Rights found the government guilty of violating the rights of the Endorois. So that is the people I'm talking about. Now, let me go to the study. Um, yeah, the summary of the study is here. Now, in this study, um, we realized that the Endorois is, is now, it finds itself as a community between two different economic model systems. The first is the neoliberal economic model that is creeping very fast and offers a quick way of economic growth for individuals. But at the same time, they still practice indigenous knowledge systems. However, the indigenous systems is, uh, the indigenous model is being uh, relegated. It is getting lost in favor of the neoliberal um, model. Um, I'm trying to... Oh. Okay. Yeah, again. And so uh, at this study, I'm looking at the definition of indigenous knowledge, which is a unique to a given society. It's a know-how unique to a given society that encompass cultural traditions, values, worldviews, beliefs, rules, and taboos. And it is not a singular body. It is a know-how in so many areas, including building, astronomy, women's unique contribution, art, storytelling, humor, environmental care. It is not shifting from my side. OK. So living indigenous, these indigenous knowledge systems and practices provide identity in the historical perspective to the people that live it. It connects people to the land and its resources and guides people in all the spheres of life provides sense of relevance, self-esteem, sustained self-identity, and their own ways of invention. So what happened, what happened to these indigenous systems? This is in the case of Africa and probably other indigenous communities. There are three factors here that I'm looking at that contributed to the assault to indigenous systems. One is colonialism. In this colonialism, we saw the pillaging and uh, the plundering of African resources leading to stagnation. We also have Christianity, Islam, that coerced African communities to submission and stagnation of their beliefs that are tied to their knowledge systems. And then we have the economic model that is rooted in, correct, in, 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 in values and ideas different from the indigenous values that is whose characteristics include individualism, capitalism, and, and kind of the stuff. So this transformed the individual from a connected participant in their drama and, and made of nature to a detached object and a personalized observer. So what is then the problem here? Sorry. Um, the problem here that I identified and I was looking at was 
that if we look at our modern uh, reality now, because of the new development, the current development model, the new liberal model of development, it has led to deleterious social, economic, and ecological factors. And because of that, there are calls from communities, from international bodies, from the governments, civil societies, and name them, to look into this deleterious social, uh, to the effects, the negative effects of the economic